Paul, Joe, Ellis, Michael, and Andre. All right, let's rock and roll. They are five of America's top detectives. This is where the homicide took place. We're trying to turn up any new evidence. Leaving their high-profile clients and comfortable offices behind. But now this dream team is convinced an innocent man is about to pay the ultimate price for a crime he didn't commit. There's no physical evidence. There's nothing that puts this man at the scene. He's so blatantly innocent. It's scary. Was there a rush to judgment? But the odds against these investigators are overwhelming. It's relatively easy to convict somebody of a crime. To undo it takes a superhuman effort. People are not happy about us reopening old wounds. Is this dream team good enough to save a man's life? We've made some serious headway. Losing is not an option. And so the stakes are as high as they get. Well, listen, when I take people on an adventure, we go on a real adventure. Why are these private detectives a long way from home? Who's got the machete? Hacking away. OK, now behind you, that one right there. This won't be set for True North, right? Taking measurements. Firing. Got it. In a bug-infested Florida orange grove. We're at the second that. crime scene. And, and this is where the homicide him. took place. Trying to solve a murder case. And we're at the end of the road right here, right? Uh -huh. That was solved a decade ago. Why? Because they think the wrong person is behind bars. To become involved at this level, I have to be convinced he's innocent. If I'm not convinced, I don't want nothing to do with it. It's got blood all over. Yeah, I know, but this is pooling blood. It's not dripping blood. Right. All right, what we have here is the crime scene number one, Holder Park. Private detective Paul Cialino has off. taken on a case that Against. most people wouldn't um. touch. His client, Crosley Alexander Green, awaiting execution on Florida's death row. This is the road that they talk about backing up into. But Paul Cialino up. is sorry to say, it's just yeah. not true. Why are you so convinced Crosley Green isn't the person who did kill him? Because there's not one iota of evidence that supports that theory. None. Zero. There's no physical evidence. What do you mean by that? There's nothing that puts this man at the scene. Throw the back seat. Cialino is so convinced that he is rounded up. Last guy's here. A dream team of investigators, some of the best PIs in the country, to help him clear Crosley's name. I and mean, we got to bring the office to the field. And of course, leading the investigation, Paul Cialino from Chicago. And what about you, Paul? I'm pretty good, you know? In 1999, he made headlines when he got a wrongfully convicted inmate, Anthony Porter, released from Illinois' death row. We're not a bunch of left-wing, silly liberals running around screaming, uh, you know, the poor man is on death row and we shouldn't kill him. A lot of people would say, why are you doing this for a guy like Crosley Green? Crosley Green is systematic of the problem we have with the death penalty in this country. We're in a rush to judgment to convict people and punish them to make ourselves feel good. Cialino believes that men like Crosley Green with criminal records are often railroaded by investigators who are pressured to solve cases. And this is a feel-good conviction to ease the tension in the community. Let's get them off the street and let's kill them and we could all go back to normal. All right, let's rock and roll. But you don't have to take his word for it. All right, girls, let's go. You're going to ride along. Because here's the directions but, again. Yeah, you see here, tree drive, burning. As 48 tree drive, hours yeah, follows it's five it's private it's eyes. Stop here, stop here, man. What's as they again? leave high profile clients. Make sure you get the Rolex in there, okay? And air conditioned offices. Man, it is hot out there. To come to a small, sweltering town in central Florida to find the truth. Who's paying for all this, Bob? Well, we're paying for it. Working for free to save the life of a man they don't even know. We've got topographic maps. We've and that's exactly what Cialino and his team are about to do. Losing is not an option. Green had recently been released from prison on drug charges, which is one reason Paul Cialino thinks police focused on him as a suspect right away. He's at the baseball game. He's around the area, but so are 30 other black guys. Unfortunately, probably none of them got out of prison recently. Case closed. Or at least it was. Crime scene's right behind it. Then we'll probably come back and work crime scene one first. Paul Cialino and his dream team of detectives Do you have, the full, uh, have come to town 
and are digging into a past that Charlie and Peggy Flynn want to forget. After only a few days in Central Florida, away from home and their families. We've been so busy, you know, the typical 16-hour day. And Nobody wanted to help. We don't have it yet. They wanted to be left alone, and they didn't want to be bothered. We need to get in touch with Tina and find out. They said she lives in Titusville. Paul Cialino and his investigators are feeling the heat. People are not happy about us reopening our wounds. Or even asking questions. <laughs> Had a gun behind the door. As they search for new evidence to prove Crosley Green was not the gunman who killed a young local man, Chip Flynn, more than 10 years earlier. With so much to do. We need to find a lot of people. And so little time. And as you know, we've only got about a week here. Cialino's team meets each night with Crosley Green supporters. Two of his sisters, Shirley and Tina, are here. So are Bill and Nan Webb. And then we want the aerial photo of the orange grove. Nan Webb, a 57-year-old housewife and anti-death penalty activist, is the reason Paul Cialino is here. After meeting Crosley in a Florida prison, she began digging into his case on her own. We had all this facts, and we didn't know quite what to do. So Nan flew to Chicago to meet the Even one here, man she I mean, thought might help, Paul Cialino. We got all these transcripts. And then we started to talk. And he said, tell me about your friend on death row. And that's what I did. He's so blatantly innocent, it's scary. And he said, I'll help him. Her sincerity convinced me. In, in, in addition, I was worried about her getting hurt out there in the streets, talking to people and being in places that she really, that, that this middle-aged uh, Caucasian housewife uh, is running around housing projects in a very dangerous area in East Florida. How would you describe Paul? Well, he looks like a big old Irish Chicago cop. But inside, there's a very humble man. Damn, I'm so smart, I can't Relay. stand myself. What I really think is that God led Paul here. That's what I believe. I told Paul he's an angel. I'm still pissed off at that Brit man. I want to give him a smack in the face. Paul Salino is an angel? That big, gruff Paul Salino? Yes, he is. That's why he's here. How you doing, sir? Angel? Is OC around? That's debatable. When's he do back, you know? Persistent? No question. Lucky? Not today. Just missed him. But nothing, nothing ventured, ventured, nothing, nothing gained. gained right. right on, but. <laughs> Joe Mora says dead ends. What'd she say, 76, Joe? Are just part of the game. That's what it is. It's just keep on hitting it, keep on hitting it. It's like baseball, you know? You strike out here, you strike out there, but every once in a while you get a single. Can you state your name, please? A double. Alan Jerome Murray. Finally, a break. A big one. Do you have a nickname? Moon. Moon, right. Moon Murray was one of several witnesses who testified against Crosley Green at his murder trial. Did you tell a jury that Crosley Green had approached you and told you that he had killed an individual? Yes, I did. And you testified to that, is that correct? Yes, I did. But in 1999, true? long after the trial, it was never true. It was a lie. Ten seconds, we're in the door, man. We already got him admitting it was all bull his testimony. Wasn't that hard On parole to at the time, Murray said he felt pressured yes, by detectives to come up with a story about Crosley Green. Any story. And so you did? They told me, said, uh, if I don't say what I what they want me to say, I go right back to the slammer. Do you believe he is telling the truth today? He seems awful truthful with me. Yeah, yeah, all right. Look at your skin, man. Having Murray's confession on videotape will help. We just keep pulling it off. But it's not enough. I don't even know where she lives. Paul and Joe need more. They need to find the prosecution's star witness. Playing cute, you know. The witness most damaging to Crosley's case. Hi, now. Because she's his own sister, Sheila Green. Sheila comes to court and says that she had a conversation with her brother at her sister's house three weeks after the crime, and that her brother says to her, uh, I committed the I murder. I submit to you that Crosley's Green's sister at that time would have said Santa Claus committed the murder if the prosecutors told her that's what she had to say. 
Well, but it, this is her brother, and she's putting him on. She's got four cut. children. She has four children. She's more concerned about them four kids than she is her brother Crosley. But getting Sheila to admit that on videotape is not going to be easy. She meets with Paul and Joe, but refuses to make a tape statement. That night, I need to get Sheila. Paul appeals to Sheila's family. We got to convince her that nothing's going to happen to her for telling us the truth. I need her on tape. I can only show Sheila love and give her love. The rest is up to Sheila. Shirley is Sheila Sheila's older lady. sister. Sheila got the lady. But do you want her to come forward now? I want her to come forward. I told her today to come forward. She will. I know she will, because she's my sister. She will. Two days later. Sheila, my name is Paul Sealing. I'm a private investigator from Chicago. Sheila Green reluctantly goes on videotape. And is Crosley Alexander Green, also known as Papa Green, your brother? Yes. Right. And publicly admits she sent her own brother to death row to save herself. Did Papa Green ever say to you that he committed a murder? No. Next. I can't believe this. He's talking to us. Another score for the Dream Team. The six, ten, six, six, down. Crosley Green has been on death row in Florida since 1990. But in just a fraction of that time. We've made some serious headway. 8.5, go. Four days to be exact. Roger. Enough headway that's going to have to open the public's eyes. Joe Mora and Paul Cialino have already tracked down not one, not two, but now three witnesses who say they lied at Green's trial. No, I'm not just saying it's just to get him off. But these tape statements aren't likely to win Crosley Green a new trial. Two of the witnesses who have come forward and changed their stories have criminal histories and may not have a lot of credibility now. That's why Paul Cialino and the detectives have to find a new witness who does. Things are going great, man. Couldn't be going better. Hey, you know Tim Curtis? Tim Curtis gave, just gave us a formal statement. He said he lied. I mean, he's just waiting for someone to come talk to him, knock on the door. And me and Joe, you were in the right place at the right time. But Tim Curtis can help them even more. Curtis knows something about Chip Flynn's truck that the detectives are going to want to hear. He can't drive a stick shift. Remarkably, Paul and Joe discover that Crosley Green might not have been able to drive Chip Flynn's truck at all. It's the stick shift, and I, get, I have trouble driving a car, OK? But even if Crosley was a skilled driver, he would have had problems driving this truck. That truck had no give to the suspension. Zero. None. Rosalie Green, who allegedly abducts these people in this truck, drives this truck, shifts this truck, turns the lights on in the truck, is touching glass on the truck, is touching the right fender, is touching the left fender, there's no fingerprints, there's no footprints, there's no hairs. Unless Crosley Green is Casper the ghost in disguise, then he couldn't have committed this crime. When we come back... There's a lot of serious problems with her story. The detectives take a closer look at Kim Halleck's story. I mean, police 101 is, man, we got to talk to the girlfriend and see what happened with her. What's her story? We have a violent crime being committed in the middle of the night with no lighting, and we have eyewitness IDs being made by a young, suggestive girl. The one witness Paul Cialino most wants to talk to is this woman, Kim Halleck. There's a lot of serious problems with her story. But she doesn't want to talk to him. I'd love to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her today, but it's never going to happen. Why not? She refuses to be interviewed. She will not talk to us. She will not talk to anybody that we're aware of. The word black man was used in this case at least 60 or 70 times during the trial. Black man this, black man that, black man this. And all they were interested in, in communicating to that jury was, this is your worst enemy. We have put our lives on hold. We are not leaving until this job is done. When we come back. Today, we are offering a $25,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the real killer in this case. Is OC around? When's he due back, you know? Just missed him. Taking on Crosley Green's case for more than three months now. Who's got the machete? Has cost these private detectives a lot in time and energy. Give up. I don't want to go into that ditch. Man. 
now. It's going to cost them a lot of money. Today, we are offering a $25,000 reward. Money coming out of their own pockets. For information leading to the arrest and conviction of the real killer in this case. Paul Cialino feels the surest way to prove Crosley Green isn't guilty of murder is to find the person who is. We're hoping that someone who has direct information in this case will come forward and be brave and tell the authorities what happened. One thing the detectives have already accomplished is that they are no longer the only ones looking into Crosley Green's case. They're not doing it because they're nice people. They're doing it because they were shamed into doing it, because this evidence is so outrageous and so corrupt that they had to do it to keep the faith of the public. They had no choice. The mystery continues. Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox. You just couldn't pick up a newspaper, you couldn't turn on the news, you couldn't pick up a magazine without seeing any reference to this case. She's been getting railroaded since the day they took her into custody. You don't have to be an American to be outraged about this. This is an injustice of biblical proportions. Britain in America, that evidence would have never seen a courtroom. If Meredith Kircher's DNA is on the blade and Amanda's is on the handle, it sounds like the murder weapon. She handled it, she stabs, and it leaves DNA on it. That's, that's not necessarily true, because there's always a transference of evidence when you live with people. Amanda's DNA is on a knife that she used that was in a kitchen drawer at Raphael's apartment. That knife was never at the murder scene. The DNA that purportedly belongs to Meredith on that knife was tested out of existence by the Italians. It was never verified. We don't know with any certainty if, if that DNA that they claim was Meredith's is on that knife. We'll never know it. And private investigator Paul Cialino says there's another problem with the knife. Police discovered two faint knife impressions on Meredith's bed. When the alleged murder knife is compared to those outlines, it doesn't match. That's the knife they want you to believe is the murder weapon, but it's not the murder weapon. It doesn't fit the outline on the sheets. If it was the murder weapon, it would fit the outline if it was used in the murder. So if the knife doesn't fit? You must acquit. The cell phone records between the three of them, the emails between the three of them. We got everybody's phone records. They all have phones. All right, let's see how many times they called each other, setting up the sex game, the orgy, the night of sex and satanic rituals. And big, big zero, nothing. No justice was served tonight, none. This was a international tragedy. One person committed this crime, not three, not two, one. They got the guy. His DNA is inside the victim's body. His fingerprints are in her purse. The harshness of the media left many wondering if the trial was about more than just murder. This is not about truth and justice. This is about getting an American and teaching America a lesson. Crime, it's everywhere. Especially on television. Show your hands now! From celebrity scandals to courtroom dramas to breaking news, America can't get enough. And we're working with investigators like Joe Moore and Paul Cialino. I mean, these are two of the baddest investigators on the block. Our role with Crime Sider to be dissect the case, to bring some clarity to an investigation. Because that's what we do professionally every day. If I were a criminal, I would not want these guys coming after me. I think Crime Sider could be socially significant because we have actually gotten people out of prison who shouldn't be there. The truth. We're saving lives and we're righting wrongs. And really, what better function can TV do than that? Veteran U.S. homicide interrogator Paul Cialino knows how it all works. Everything is controlled from the minute you bring him in that room, okay? The way, where you're sitting, where he's sitting. You never want to put a desk between you and anybody, okay? Never. You never interview from across a desk. You always want to get close. You start out kind of far, but as the interrogation goes on, you move in closer because you want that physical, you want that intimate touch with somebody. See how his arms are folded up? Now this tells the interrogator he's in trouble and he's, he's nervous. Because when you fold your arms up, you're closing yourself up psychologically, okay? And look, at, he's looking down the whole time. He's not making great eye contact. And, and the interrogator hits him with a great line in there. He goes, well, that's why we're here on a Sunday, because we want it to be discreet. That's 
ridiculous, okay? Because they don't care about being discreet at this point. They, they care about getting them, but that's a great comeback. If you're an interrogator, right now you're thinking, this is a guilty guy. This guy is guilty, and I'm going to get him. Bad move, okay? What he should have said was, impossible. Couldn't have happened. But see, and you could see what's happening here. He's, he's got his arms folded, and he's nodding. His body language is saying, yes, I was there. What's coming out of his mouth isn't that convincing as well. Because he, he's so, he is so tore up inside right now because he's thinking, where did I drive? What did I do that night? Where was I? Was I north? Of, he's trying to think five steps ahead of this guy. It's just not going to happen. But his whole body is indicating, man, am I in trouble. I have a serious problem. Paul Cialino is a former U.S. homicide investigator and interrogation expert. This is what we call a confrontation. And what's the colonel doing during this? He's nodding. He's going, his dad's nodding up and down. That's an involuntary reaction, we call. But that's indicative of what's going on internally. And what he's nodding to is, holy shit, it's my boot. He got my boot print. He's thinking, God, how, did, how dumb am I to wear the same boots to the police station today? He grabs the paperwork and he's got it, right? Now what he's doing is trying to figure out an explanation to give this guy. Because he knows, man, I am screwed. I am so screwed. He's buying time, and we, and we call this buying time. Now what the detective does, though, is, is great. Because a lot of detectives, they'll keep talking. But silence is great, okay? Because now it becomes very uncomfortable. Getting Williams to view a map of the location of Lloyd's body is the turning point, says interrogation expert Paul Cialino. Every detective assigned to this case is watching this thing on tape, or uh, live feed. And, or, I don't see any mirrors in there, but there, there's a camera in there, clearly. So they're watching it. And uh, you want to know what they're doing? Yes, we got him, we got his ass. Yes, 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 go get him. I mean, that's what's going on outside that room. But right now, there's a big celebration going on because they know they own this guy right now. He knows to this guy, other than his military career, his wife is everything. What he's thinking, oh, I got 600 pairs of people's underwear in my house and my wife is gonna be out of her mind. How, do I want the TVs out in front of her house for the next two years? Do I want them destroying and ripping up the house? This tape will be played in every interrogation course in the world, English speaking one, and probably other ones, as how to do it. This guy's doing it, this is classic. Yesterday, we began to unravel the mystery of the tragic death of Rebecca Zahal. Because of the sensitive nature of this topic, we closed the set. No audience, no distractions, so I could talk to her sister Mary and brother-in-law Doug alone. They do not believe that Rebecca committed suicide, and they have many unanswered questions. Today is the day we reveal the results of the all-new autopsy that they requested. Before we get to that, here's what happened. Come on, emergency. What are you reporting? I got a girl. Hung herself. 32 year old Rebecca Zahal was found hanging nude and bound from a balcony in the mansion's courtyard. The house belongs to Jonah Shacknai, an Arizona pharmaceutical tycoon. Zahal's nude body was found just days after her boyfriend's son took a fall at the home that would end his life. According to family members, Rebecca Zahal was watching over Max at the time. Zahal had been dating Jonah Shacknai for at least two years. Our office concluded that the cause of death was hanging and the manner of death. The suicide. The Zahal family does not believe that she committed suicide. You feel like they just simply didn't follow the evidence, they didn't follow the sign. That's correct. Private investigator Paul Cialino offered his services to help this family find answers. I want to tell you, in this case, there's nothing, nothing that indicates to me that this woman committed suicide. One neighbor said his wife heard screams coming from there? Yes. How she described it, I heard a woman calling for help. There's a neighbor on the other side of the house that repeats the same thing. Now, we have two independent people who went to the authorities, and it was pretty much discounted. Paul, when you visited the site down there, understand that at this point, uh, the house is for sale? Yes, sir. Um, it, it's for sale, and people are walking up all around it and photographing it. It's empty, and it's for sale. So there's been no preservation of, of the scene at all? Oh, it's shot. So there, there's no evidence to be found from the scene at this point. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. You always want to take another shot at it if you can. You right. never know. But uh, it, the likelihood is small. Right. Now, when you 
interviewed people in and around the area down there. You talked to a man that said that he saw someone moving about the property that night. What he found was her behavior was bizarre. Mm -hmm. he, as he explained it to me, he said, listen, I don't know what she was doing, but she seemed like she was out of it. She's looking in the windows. She's walking back and forth between the driveway and the front door. Uh, she walks halfway up the drive, she would come back down and just thought her behavior was a little bizarre. And he said he had a lot of time to watch it. He's waiting for his wife and uh, child to catch up on bicycles. Mm -hmm. And it just struck him that this was some bizarre behavior mm -hmm. on the part of this lady. Right. So basically w what you found down there is real inconsistency between the interpretation of physical evidence and the scene itself, the, the degree of drop Yes. And the extent of the injury was very troubling. Yes. We saw the difference in the way the bed moved when it was recreated versus when it actually happened, which wasn't scientific, but was seemed to me to be a, that was a pretty ABC sort of thing, uh, force applied to the anchor, it moves or it doesn't. I mean, that's very concerning. Um, uh, there was a person observed on the property that night, and then two independent neighbors that don't know each other report hearing a woman scream from this location. Paul, should this be an independent investigation instead of back to the Sheriff's Department in San Diego? Well, I, you know, it's really difficult for them to reinvestigate themselves. And it probably wouldn't be fair to ask them to do it. I, I, I don't think we'd get the, sh the fair shake we need on this. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so it has to, it really should be somebody independent of them and uh, has access to the evidence, is able to test it the way it should have been tested the first time, and we could go from there. Paul, anything from you too? Well, listen, this is the preeminent forensic medical examiner in the world today. And when Sarah Weck says something like this, you ought to really pay attention because he, he's only stating his professional opinion based on right. 40,000 autopsies. Right. Dr. Weck, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Mary. Other investigators started to eliminate all eventualities, other than a plane crash. My name is Paul Cialino, and I am a licensed private investigator. I was hired by an insurance adjuster out of Louisiana, a man by the name of Robert Davis. He was concerned about a potential claim that may have been filed on Mr. Fawcett's estate. He was concerned that perhaps he wasn't missing, and he may be alive. Cialino has investigated many disappearances, some of them criminal. People fake their death, they go missing for a lot of reasons. Usually they're running some kind of financial scheme and they're in big trouble. The federal alleys are closing in on them. Their wife just caught them fooling around. A lot of people, especially wealthy people, sometimes they just kind of check out. We're done. I'm walking away from this. And then the multimillionaire's private life came under scrutiny. We talked to a couple of women who said that they had relationships with them. They couldn't prove it to my satisfaction. Everything I could gather, I wouldn't be willing to sit in a courtroom and say Mr. Fawcett was having an affair with anybody. They had spent the evening at an Indian casino up north of Topeka. We eventually got the videotapes from the casino. Looked like they were having a good time. Mike Sisko was a wonderful man. He loved my mom. They were perfect for each other. My dad was really in my life growing up. If you can picture Tim Allen from Home Improvement, that guy, that's him. <laughs> he was really my hero. My mom was an amazing woman. She didn't have enemies. She did not have one enemy. Private investigators Paul Cialino and Joe Mora are on the job. They have come to Topeka, Kansas for 48 hours to examine the case. We want to thank you all for coming tonight. Talk to the families and try to move the investigation forward. We want to go in a direction to make sure that no stone is left unturned getting some justice for your sister, for your daughter, for your son, for your dad, okay, your brother. 
Their first stop? The fence in the back's been changed. The crime scene. Well, this is the place, Paul. And that's where the bodies were found. It's been a long time. The house has been sold and the room changed. But the detectives still think walking these rooms can reveal things about the killer. I don't think this was done by a cold-blooded killer, professional assassin yet. It was done by somebody who gave it a lot of thought, though. They, yeah, I agree with you. It gave it a lot of thought. The people that got killed here knew the assailant. This was somebody who had a terrific hatred for these two people. I think that was the point of entry. Next, the detectives talked to the families. You guys were the ones that found them, right? Yes. yes. Harold? You're Karen's brother. That's correct. Tim, you're Mike's brother. Right. My older brother, eight years older than me. You were with Mike right before he got killed, weren't you? I was. Uh... Mike's brother-in-law, Mark Boots, had been fishing with Mike just before the murders. How often does a father get custody of his children? I mean, it's very... Well, I mean, how often do you read a file like this and everything favors the father? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's very uh, rare. It, it, it's just extremely rare. So obviously there were issues there that was well documented that things turned in favor of the father. And I think that's one of the reasons why she was just irate to no end. She'd walk the alleys behind the house. So there's a history of her surveilling, watching, oh. stalking. Oh. Multiple times we'd be together and all of a sudden we'd go, whoop, there went Dana. And now at this point, she was living, you know, out of the town or out of the state and just show up and drive by. The fire department was here first. Harold Warswick thought there were so many cops in and out of the house that first day that they compromised the crime scene. I thought, well, if, if there's any good evidence down here, they were walking on it. If there was any evidence there, they had destroyed it. They didn't preserve the crime scene. They didn't collect evidence as they should have. They destroyed evidence that could have helped them get a conviction in this case. Thank you.